That Spider-Man quote is legendary because it's extremely true. Life imitates art and art imitates life and it goes hand in hand. And so uh, for those who are out there who are struggling to find their own style, to struggling to find themselves, go into art. Try and find art pieces and, and dive into them and immerse yourself. And I guarantee you, you will learn a lot from that. Welcome to Discover More Podcast. Expect to learn the reality of being captured by an audience as an influencer, the art of saying no, and the best way to fight against the modern culture of never-ending distractions and the culture of more, more, and more. James, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for having me, man. Appreciate that. Thank you for the intro, too. That was incredible. Thank you. What do you think that means to you, being an artist or even as a creative that you are? I'm vulnerable to the world around me. And art is this thing where it, it builds me up to the strong individual who I know that I am, who I see in the future as this person that I look up to. No one else knew of the manga that I was reading. Nobody was listening to the music that I was listening to. Nobody was diving into uh, deep art uh, at the level that I am or that I was doing at the time. And I wasn't able to have conversations with that to anyone else. So there was a lot of reinforcement that I had to give to myself and to validate myself um, because that validation is important, you know, to keep yourself set on the line that you're trying to strive on with no one else around to kind of help you out. Um, it's a, it, you, you grow to really love your craft even more because it's so much of you into it. So a lot of it was through selfish intent, you know, whether that was like entrepreneurship through my art, whether that was through um, uh, emotional growth through my art, through physical growth through my art, just how I interacted with a lot of things. It was all for myself and the betterment of myself. And what does that mean for myself? But a lot of it was through this personal reinforcement of like, no, this art is important. What you're learning is important. What you're doing is important. And just continuously doing that over and over and over again from like, honestly, from middle school to where I am now, it's still going with that. Yeah, I think uh, language is important because we are both the stories we tell about ourselves and others. So I want to challenge you with your term selfish. It sounds like it's more self-serving. That art is not only your coping mechanism to deal with the isolations and ostracizations by your friends, who didn't understand this force of nature, as you said, with your gravitational pull towards art, which is sacred for you. So I wouldn't say it was selfish. I think it sounds more like self-protective and self-serving because you talked about it. I think being an artist and YouTuber or content creator that a lot of the public doesn't know about, it's a very lonely path. All of the great artists that I look up to or respect, they really have this single focus into this craftsmanship. And I heard this saying a long time ago, I forgot who said it, it's something like be nice to the ones you used to bully because those people are going to rule the world. I'm a little bit older than you are, but when I was growing up, being nerdy or geeky or into computer or tech was not a cool thing. Now it is. So I feel it's a cool that society at large is recognizing these early talents that may not fit the mold of what society or what a normal pathways air quote kind of looks like. I stumbled upon those aspects of technology alongside with my love of art, kind of like almost at the same time. Uh, and when I say love of art, more so like what I wanted to do with my life. And as life continued, you know, using that as like a shield, you know, using that art form as more than just the physical creation of things, but a lifestyle for me, a sense of protection and accountability and responsibility and making myself a human a better human. And what does that mean? Uh, so like the definition and the value of art kind of leveled up for me outside of being just a creation of sorts, whether if it's for myself or for other people, it's genuinely uh, a lifestyle to me, you know, and that was a conscious choice I, I, I made as well. But it, it really does help. Like you said, it, it's a place where I'm able to feel safe. It's a place where I'm able to heal. It's a place where I'm able to um, analyze and to break down and to make better decisions for myself, which is essentially what life is all about. So I, it's it's great that 
art is able to segue itself as to being a good life lesson <laughs> for me too, outside of it being just, you know, clearly a demonstration of someone's talents. Yeah, I love when you said art is a lifestyle. That could be a pretty catchy uh, title for the episode. We'll see if I use that. But like, I like art because art is so nuanced. Like who is to say that this art is good, that art is bad? It's entirely subjective, I think. And that's why I think art is a lifestyle because life is the nuances, right? At least the way I see it. So I want to push you a little bit further into, like you said, your art, whether it's creative field of film directing or making YouTube now. Yes, it is a safe place. But how do you process or deal with that loneliness that I alluded to earlier? The best way I can answer that is you have to know yourself and, and accountability is key, especially with artists. Uh, artists, we love to, you know, have that like, oh yeah, I can, I can fuel myself through myself, but you have to be responsible for what that means. And that means that the cuts that are going to happen to you, the bruises that you receive from life, that's all going to be on you. And that mental fortitude is important. It is a lonely road. It is a lonely street and path to, to walk on. And honestly, not a lot of people are probably meant for it, especially when tackling on like, you know, growing a business through social media, because it's like a whole other thing. But uh, for anyone that is attempted to tackle it, I think the best thing they can do for themselves is to recognize and take accountability and responsibility for what is to come from being an artist who's a freelancer, who is trying to be their own boss. What does that truly mean? And are you truly ready for what that implies? You know, because that implies a lot of stuff and even the things that you aren't even uh, looking out for, you know, just getting blindsided. What does that mean when a pandemic happens? What does that mean when a relationship during this moment of your life as an artist happens? How does that affect your work? How does school affect your work? How does your parents do that? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it is a lifestyle because genuinely for those who take it seriously, their life is their art and their art is their life. And there's a lot of sources that can influence that, that can also destabilize that. But if you are accountable and if you are strong enough to understand what this means, all of those can be components in your art. And that is a powerful thing because that literally means anything that happens, you can genuinely take as a life lesson and in, in order to sharpen your craft, to sharpen what it means to you to be an artist. And doesn't make the falls and the fells and the, the cuts and the bruises any less painful, but it makes that mind of yours that much sharper. And that's like something that helps with every elevation, every level up, I guess you could say, as being a human, as an artist, as a person within their craft, it's just better being able to know what these stakes mean. I guess another thing I wanted to add too is understanding and being vulnerable with yourself, you know, not putting up a front. And again, artists, they love, they love doing that. They love thinking that we're perfect. We're not perfect. And I think that's what makes it so beautiful. But it's up to, you know, the person, the artist, the human to understand that you have to be vulnerable and open, but at the same time, know that you can, you, you have the strength to be as strong and as courageous and as fearless as you can. It's like a pendulum. Yeah. I think, uh, unless your last name is Christ, first name is Jesus. Nobody's perfect, <laughs> right? <laughs> no one's perfect. And of course, like vulnerability strength is an idea by Brene Brown, right? The prominent research went to shame and guilt. And another quote that reminds me of is like Spider-Man quote, right? With great power comes great responsibility. But I think the reverse is also true. With great responsibilities comes great power. Because I view accountability as synonymous with responsibility. And I think if you can truly be accountable with the help or by yourself, since everyone has different genetics and variables and circumstances, if you can truly internalize and accept that, oh, I have great responsibility to do X, Y, and Z, you do that long enough, that translates into power. It sounds very counterintuitive, but when you really can accept and live your life through this internalized responsibility, 
you have a lot of immense power within you and that is what we call empowerment so do you have any thoughts with what i said in terms of great responsibility comes with great power because i know you're a huge uh, spider-man marvel fan as well anime other art forms manga were great pieces for me to not really feel lonely and learn some of these valuable lessons that i've learned as a human um, like, you know, Naruto and Jiraiya and all of these people that have influenced me in a way that I've grown as a human. And if I grow as a human, my art is going to grow as well because I've already made the responsibility of accepting that, no, this is the type of artist I want to be. This is the type of person I want to be. That Spider-Man quote is legendary because it's extremely true. Life imitates art and art imitates life and it goes hand in hand. And so uh, for those who are out there who are struggling to find their own style, to struggling to find themselves, go into art. Try and find art pieces and, and dive into them and immerse yourself. And I guarantee you, you will learn a lot from that. But like you said, it's not just an artist thing. If when you're in this place where you feel like you can't you can't break out of and you, you can't get out of bed or you just don't want to go out. I, I really do challenge people to just throw themselves into these sources because they won't judge you. These things won't try and misguide or, you know, stir up your sauce or anything. It's still, it's only going to amplify it. And that's the beautiful thing. That's why books are great. That's why manga is great. Anime is great. Cartoons are great, especially when they're made out of you know pure intention yeah i want to highlight and zoom in on something you said you said that these entities don't judge you i love that because i've never thought about it this way but whether you subscribe to the belief of god universe the source the oneness whatever names you want to label them as in this case books or art judgment comes from a place of ego and art and books and these entities do not have ego they're egoless because ego is a human characteristics. And that's why you're right. They cannot and they will never judge you because they're egoless. I do want to go in and ask you about something a little bit further and a little bit deeper. You talked about life imitates art. Can you elaborate more? Uh, something that I've, I've realized, especially now, because I was very impatient younger, <laughs> very, very impatient younger. And it showed like that was the conflict that I had prior to the revelations that I had in my recent years, that it was how I continue meeting time. And it was always that friction. And it always did something with my art and not necessarily in imagery, but more so with how I felt with myself, which is art too. So it's one of those things where I had to not necessarily adapt, but learn more from, you know, life imitates art. It's like time is between all of that. And it's how one uses that time. You know, we're wielders of time, if we can think of that like that. And I'm truly starting to understand what that means, not just in a art sense, but more so in a sense of like a human sense, a soul. Like, how does this feel towards my soul? And it's been helping me out tremendously, thus improving my art. Yeah, I feel like this is this may sound very esoteric, but because time, time is a construct, right? I read a little and I know a tiny bit of like astrophysics, physics like that. And I do know that like the stars we see every single day, many of those stars are already dead, but they're liars and liars and liars away. What that means is by the time the projections of the light that reflects a star get to our human eyes, those stars already could have been ceased to exist. That means we're concurrently in real time air quote peering into the past while we're in the present don't ask me any questions but this is these are factual statements and it makes my head hurt because i don't understand you know right it's the meta philosophy epistemology all these things but i share that because in that sense since time is a construct time is limitless there is no limit to time because how can there be a limit to a construct of an idea at the same time, we humans through our ego and our perceptions of reality, we put confinements on time so we can wield them, as you said. At the same time, we don't wield it perfectly because there's ego, there's fear, anxiety, depressions, comparison syndrome, imposter syndromes, the urgency, right? Because life is short and 
long. You can achieve a lot of things in life by being intentional, by being responsible, by being accountable. And that's one of those paradoxes that are simultaneously true and sound conflicting. And humans are one of the few species that can hold two seemingly contradicting things at the same time. That's what makes us humans, right? It's, it's funny that you, that you mentioned that you can physically see the past because that's how it feels with me when I go on these hikes and when I hike a mountain that I do multiple times and I have like a different experience, but I feel stronger in a way. And I love that because it genuinely feels that's how good art is, like, like really genuinely good art is supposed to be made. It's just one of those cycles that I feel is continuous and a lot of things that I admire in life, hence why life imitates art. I see a lot of the things that I cherish within art that I hold to a high degree, the same thing unfolding in front of me in life that I am like, wow, like I, I love this. I genuinely love experiencing this. This is a good moment. This is a genuinely human moment. Um, and that's, that's something that I had to, I had to learn. And it all, it all wraps around time. It all deals with time um, because it is long, but yeah, it's like you said, it's also very short, but it has so much within that. <laughs> it's crazy. I feel like the reason why you can peer into the past through a portal when you go hiking, it might be that powerful ganja that you're smoking, but you know, <laughs> 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 but it is, um, uh, cause I do view, uh, marijuana in some sense as like the um, performance en enhancement drug for a lot of artists because it does create multiple dimensional thinkings and poorways into your minds. Like when people are like, oh, I had a light bulb moment or zap and the idea comes to me, what does that even fucking mean? Right. We don't know. Like, are we, I think our brains are antenna and we're collected, we're connected to this collective consciousness because I believe in a philosophy of oneness. And I'm also very spiritual, esoteric, and religious. And I am a clinician working towards psychedelic therapy. So that might explain my per, uh, perspective. But um, yeah, it's very interesting. So I do want to ask you about something more specific in terms of the cycle, in terms of the grounding mechanism that you alluded to in regards to manga, anime, and films. So many people go to podcasting and audiobooks and a lot of the personal development books for insights and personal growth. I belong into that category. I've been a personal development junkie since 13. I read The Secret and I haven't stopped reading for a while. I haven't picked up a personal growth book in a while because as you understand, there is a few sets of universal truth and if you can really practice and refine those truths, you don't need more motivations. You, need, you don't need more toolkits. The toolkits I have in, in my box personally are sufficient. And that when the needs arise, then I will read more books. But now I think I have enough toolkits for me personally. But for you, James, you chose the avenue of anime, manga, and films for your avenue of personal development. So what about these specific types of storytelling that really called out your name? I think it was, it was first a feeling of loneliness. That's what, what, what we talked about previously. It was that I didn't really have anyone to share the same level of love that I have for these things around me. The things that I love, for example, like Naruto, this unwavering faith in himself and now I don't have a demon fox in my belly, but you know, <laughs> but like I, I know what it feels like to be ostracized. I know what it feels like to be to yourself, yet still have this dream that requires you to be noticed by everyone, to go past beyond everyone's expectations because it's your dream. And that right there was just one of those themes that you know I picked up on. And obviously through brilliant writing and, you know, Kishimoto, who's the author of Naruto, just continuing that theme and then evolving it. And I'm growing up along with this while also picking up other animes and mangas. You start to get that this isn't just a kid's show. This isn't just a an anime even like this is a real human being behind this, that written this, that drew this, that put these themes in here for a reason. There was intention with this. And that's what it really started clicking in for me where I was like, wow, okay, like a human did this. That level of appreciation and respect branched into films and more so with films because films where it's a little bit more 
it was a little less uh, chaotic as anime and manga. It's a little bit more grounded in a sense, but the themes still are the same. You have to have intention. You know, f- the films that I love, you know, the, you know, like Blade Runner and obviously a lot of Quentin Tarantino films, but then you have like, you know, Lawrence of Arabia that I just recently watched and I'm digesting and analyzing these films on the spot for, you know, my YouTube audience as well too. And the reason why I'm able to do so uh, in, in a way that almost seems effortless is because I genuinely understand the intention. I know that there was intention behind certain things to every frame. And that's just been a principle I kept with myself ever since graduating high school and leading myself into college and then where I am now is that you no know, art has like really good art, especially ones that I appreciate has great intention. Nothing is you know, good and nothing is bad, but everything can be good. Everything can be bad. But I do believe there is a threshold and that comes forth with intention and that comes forth with how you go about executing that intention. There is like a an echelon of that. Anybody can break through it. That's a great thing, but it does require intention. And I think that level uh, is something that I appreciated in all forms of films and anime and manga yeah i don't think it's just intention though because i do want to nuance this where i did say earlier that i think art is entirely subjective and there is no good or bad however there is a difference between great art and good art and i think that threshold is as you say intention and b the ability for the artist or the author to connect on an emotional level with the audience i think that makes a great art and the third piece is as you said, like with Naruto, right? Because Naruto is the embodiment of this archetype of a hero's journey, which is an archetype in a lot of storytelling. And because he embarks on a journey to better himself, at the same time, he also empowers and provides confidence for all his peers. He's the one always says, you could do it, you could do it. And now, of course, he becomes one of the greatest and he brings back triumph and resources to the village, his fire village. Right. And that's the hero's journey. It's not just for yourself. You ultimately have to provide and, um, I guess, revive the entire village. But the fact that you're able to rewatch the same sequence and series of anime, yet derive different meanings based on different chapters of life you're in, I think that's the third characteristics of a great art. These are the my limited understanding of what a great art can be. Uh, but I do think there's a difference between good art and great art with what we talked about. So I do want to talk a little bit more about the hero's journey, right? Because like for you, as you said, you are bettering yourself throughout your journey since high school, right? You've been on this quote unquote lonely path because of your die hard and hyper focused intention into your arts and craftsmanship. And through that, you provide value and you try to elevate others through a YouTube channel, which you have 110,000 subscribers, which is a, it's a, that's a lot of people, right? But how do you personally, James, view Hero's Journey, the way I explained it? And what does that mean to you, if any? It's an interesting trope because it's essentially is built off of one's perseverance, you know, unwavering power in themselves. So I think the Hero Trope is a brilliant teaching of character of of life and people can you know really extract from that because it's not just you know the adventure it's what happens during the adventure that makes it great it's not just the destination of the hikes it's a journey of the hikes it's the journey that makes these stories it's not just the beginning and the end page it's everything in between that you know that would be a boring ass movie or film or anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Crazy build up, yeah. but nothing and just a conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe you get to see a little bit of the credits at the end. Yeah, just end scene credits. Yeah, I think that's um, really important because I want to provide a quick clinical perspective. It's like the uh, idea of reminding ourselves about our immense resilience. I think for anyone that's dealing with lows in this in the dark seasons of life because life ebbs and flows and it's seasonal a lot of people might think to themselves oh man how can i possibly work through or move through this obstacle how can i possibly come out of this dark space to that i want to remind those folks that you're here aren't you the fact that you're here that means you've worked through and moved through a lot of the obstacles before you could have been last year two months ago 10 years ago 
Who knows? But I don't know anyone that does not have any challenges. But the fact that you're having this anxious or negative thought about, oh boy, how can I ever come out of this state alive? Remind yourself, you're here literally having that thought. That means you did came out of whatever previous circumstances alive. And I think reminding us of our resilience and how far we've come in life is a great pattern recognition and great way to seek out evidence that, oh, am I capable of this? Oh yeah, I am. How do I know that? Oh yeah, I survived X, Y, and Z. Oh, I had this issues. I came through. So there's a lot of data points, a lot of evidence in all of our lives to remind us that we are capable. But then the circumstances does darken that perceptions or that memory. And it might distort it sometimes too. But just remind us that we do have the resilience in all of us. Yeah. What you just said is how art makes me feel. Um, it's why I believe and why I you know, hold art to me as such a sacred foundation in my life because it is it is that remedy. It's the remembrance of how strong I am, you know, and, and what I've gone through. Yeah, man, I, I agree 100% with that. And also, like, Kid Cudi is another musician, one of my all-time favorites, Men on the Moon, one of my all-time favorite hip-hop albums. But his song, like, Pursuit of Happiness, it sounds cherry, groovy AF. You really dissect what he's going through. Like, man, he's going through some dark and painful and depressive and suicidal periods. But as you said, that song and or uh, Logics, right, uh, 1800, the Suicide Hotline. I, mean, I read a study that that song has saved a staggering amount of adolescents' life from suicide. So as you said, art does imitate life. And life, there's lifelines within life, the container of life. Similarly, there's lifelines of help within art as well. Because as you said, I think it's just, it, art is a reflection of our interpretations of life. So in the intro, I talked about one of the topics I want to dive into, and this is where you want to put in your seatbelts or getting into the tready heavy hitter territory. So a lot of influencers, whether it's YouTube, social media, but generally YouTube, we call it prosumer, right? Producers and consumer. And a lot of the key ingredients that you, for YouTubers to make it, quote unquote, is to use uh, search-based content. What that means is you do your research and you find out what are the content, what are the trends, what are the highest performing videos to the audience is liking. And then you reverse engineering and cater your content to that. I don't do that as a podcaster because it's podcast, right? It's unscripted, so it's kind of hard. So it's different territory there. But for you and many YouTubers, that's what they do. So a lot of the influencers are trapped by this audience captive phenomenon. What that means is they become the curated persona they created to appease the content that the viewership likes. At the same time, they lose their true self to this curated persona because you do that long enough. Like what is personalities? Personality is what you perceive as, are people going to like this part of myself? Is this going to be validated? And we used to do that with our close knit groups, like small communities throughout the world. But now the entire world can validate or invalidate you. So I feel like this audience kept a phenomena is extremely dangerous because when you lose yourself, you don't know you lost yourself because your audience is going to love what you're doing. The more you appease the audience, the higher the yields, the higher the ROI in terms of the context of the viewerships and popularity, yada, yada. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you make sure your course is as aligned, as pure as your true self, not this curated persona of James versus cinema? Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about the North Star, you know, in a sense of keeping your morals aligned. And that sort of was the mindset I had going into YouTube because I'm the type of person where uh, the best way to explain it is if my mom sees me acting different online, she'll check, yeah, you. She'll check me. And I don't <laughs> want to be in a position to where it's like, like to where my friends and the people that are close to me, like, you know, I obviously like my mom, but also to myself, you know, if I, if I know that I am not genuinely being myself, that's going to mess me up. That's that's going to make my journey worse. <laughs> and I know that. And I don't want to take responsibility for that. I don't want to do that. So what's the best way to counteract that? 
just being yourself on the internet. And as I guess you say, as hard as it sounds, that's the intention that I went into with YouTube is I'm only going to do this if I can just be myself. Because I never really wanted to be like, you know, a YouTuber. I just thought it would be great. And then, you know, the next level was when I, you know, when COVID happened and I was using it more so of a way to keep me educated, to keep me in love with, you know, filmmaking. And it just so happened that it also blow up as well, too. But the whole data and just when you can, when you see it all in numbers, when you see it all with through graphs and when you, see it when they're like, oh, yeah, your video is performing like this. And oh, your video isn't performing like this or, you know, less viewers on this one. Oh, you have a lot of viewers on this one. That's when, at least for me, YouTube really, I started to see what YouTube was. I started to really see it. There's a game that's meant to be played and you have to decide whether or not you want to play it or not. You can play it, but it's going to have some damaging effects later on. Just because for me personally, I, again, I like sleeping good at night and I just can't get with me not acting how I am now on the internet. Like I, I am, I, that, that, that is me. <laughs> for anybody who decides to watch this and decide to go to my YouTube or to any other platform, you know, that, that is me. And I've always been that of me. Yeah, YouTube does this in incognito effect. It clearly shows you like, hey, you can make a lot doing this because you're making us a lot doing this. But how do you feel? How do you feel? You always got to ask yourself, how do you feel about doing this? How do you feel when doing this? Because it can cause even to someone like me, um, it sent me through depressions. It sent me through uh, a lack of faith within myself. It sent me into asking what it even is that I'm doing, you know, reading comments and stuff like that where people don't know me, but are either acting like they do or acting like they do and talking bad about me. And, you know, not clearly understanding that I went through a whole life prior to YouTube. There's so many elements that come along with entering this landscape that is still pretty new that I just didn't have any coaching on. I was just kind of like in the fray with it. But again, I think the reason why I'm doing so well is because my intention going into it was I'm going to be me regardless. You know, you can stay true to yourself. You just have to accept that it probably going to take longer. <laughs> it's probably going to be a little bit harder and you won't make as much, but it's worth it because I think that's what makes, you know, like you said, it rises from good to great. Yeah, and I think the tough part is, I mean, I know you you upload like six videos a week, every single week for the past two years. I, mean, I know you took no time off and tremendous hours go into it. So of course, it's in human nature to get be seen, be heard, and right? So when you're exerting that much hour, I mean, that many hours every week for years with no break, of course, you want to, be validated by your art. At the same time, that validation cannot take over your art, right? And that's the North Star we're talking about. And to me, it sounds like you, you know, of course, this comes and go, and you may hit a different depression point, another mental fuckery designed by YouTube to fuck with us, to monetize attentions and keep the viewership as long as possible through whatever it takes. You might get that in a million or whatever, but at least you have this awareness and. I feel like if you can maintain this approach, it's almost like you're hacking the system. What I mean by that is if you aim for authentic self as your metric, if your metric, your, if your internal metrics is no longer about the numbers or the viewership, but rather can James Adams III be as accurately translated into James versus cinema? If that is your internal metrics, then your viewers that you attract are also going to feel that. So when you're being inauthentic, your viewer is gonna call you out. So in a way, the best way to grow your platform is by being adhering to your internal metrics or being yourself. So when you're not being yourself, you may lose viewers. That doesn't mean you're immune to this audience captive YouTube fuckery phenomenon. At the same time, I think it gives you a stronger anchor to be grounded because it's an entirely different metrics. And of, of course, like this is very difficult thing to do. And 
As you know, James, my YouTube journey is infancy stage. I've been on YouTube for about three months now. And this is a very trivial example, but I just want to share it quickly to really make this point home. So I know the difference between intentions and goal. I don't really set goals because I think it's in human nature that when you set a goal, for example, you want to lose 30 pounds by the end of whatever. If you don't lose that 30 pounds, a lot of people may think, oh, I failed that goal. You didn't. Even if you lost five pounds or 10 pounds, you still lost five pounds and 10 pounds. You just fell short of that goal. So I say intention. So three months ago, I set an intention for myself that I want to achieve thousand subscriber mark. And I didn't hit that thousand. I'm pretty close now, but I fell a bit short. And my videos gets about like anywhere from 500 to like 1500. Some of them have thousands of views. And it's we are even talking about this now because when I first started, I had six views, 16 views. And when I got like 61 views or like 102 views, I was like, yes, 100 people viewed me talking to an expert for an hour, an hour and a half. That is because we're competing with Netflix. We're competing with Hulu. We're competing with these mega billion corporations. But now I don't even think about, I was like, oh, this only got 1,500 views. Only 1,500 people watched my video. Pathetic. Just think about that. Yeah, and for me, the um, the spiritual process I told you offline that I've been going through is, as you said, I think I accepted that if I truly believe in myself as a podcaster, if I truly believe in my capacity as an interviewer and as a facilitator of meaningful conversations, why do I have to be confined by this arbitrary construct of three months? That makes no sense to me, yet it's all a fragment of my own imaginations. So now I feel so much at peace. The amount of mental and emotional eggs I put into the basket of YouTube has subsided dramatically. And I feel relaxed. I feel calm. I feel like I have the longevity and the stamina to do this for a long time. And I thought as soon as I make that switch, I'll lose my viewership or I would whatever. That didn't really happen. And I was like, oh yeah, these are our internal demons making shit up in our brains. Audience doesn't know. They just, we're just one of the hundreds of YouTubers to subscribe to. They don't, they don't care if we're producing one or two or three videos a week. They literally don't care. YouTube cares, right? But I wanted to share my example to a double down on this example. And you can extrapolate this beyond the YouTube space into your deliverables, your project. When you feel like you're so stressed working in a large corporate setting, remind yourself, you're working for a billion or Fortune 50 or multi-multi-million corporations. They don't give a fuck about your well-being. Remind yourself that and uh, uh, do your thing. Make sure you don't get fired and be optimal and be professional in your job. And don't get lazy, right? At the same time, it's not end-all be-all. And what I see often is even outside of YouTube, but let's say in this case, specifically YouTube, people going into YouTube for financial reasons, like for I want to make more money and they see YouTube as a, a way for them to make money because they either hear how much money YouTubers are making or maybe they just want to do it. And by all means, you can do whatever you want. Just it, it's going to be a very miserable ride because of the whole mental aspect that comes along with it. Even if you know how to edit and you know how to you know, shoot this and, you know, curate a video, you will be blindsided by the mental aspect of YouTube. It's like you said, if you are able to genuinely see future version of yourself, that is a, a continuation of you being authentic on this platform, then a ripple effect happens because, you know, you're just putting a video up for yourself, but, oh, well, once you look at that, you get two views or you get 20 views, get 200 views, get 2,000, 200,000. And it's like that form of momentum with your mindset that I think really helps aid you from a lot of the blind sides that YouTube as a business, as a company that wants to make money from you and essentially use you can do to people because YouTube is just an algorithmic system, you know, and we're just, we're, we're humans. We're completely different of that. Yeah, so I want to take a soft pivot from the YouTube. During our quality process, one of the proudest achievements, and you talked about sleep earlier in your response, your proudest achievement is that you can be a high 
functioning YouTuber with a very considerable size of audience while still sleeping peacefully and sleeping, like getting your needed sleep every night, you put that as one of your highest achievements. And of course, we, as we all know, sleep is one of the most important recovery mechanism that we have from our brain, REM cycle, restore sleep the whole nine. Can you elaborate more of why you're so proud of the fact that you can sleep well at night, where in America, we glorify work till you die mindset. Mm. I mean, I, I can I can relate to that mindset because that's what it was like the hustle, the grind stages. And all of that came to a head when I moved out to California and I was really at the pinnacle of that mindset. You know, I graduated college and I've done everything through myself. I've worked with a crap ton of co- uh, clients. I've done a bunch of personal work as well too. And now I'm at the stage of where it happens. I've been dreaming of California for like six to seven years. This is it. And I'm finally here and I'm noticing it doesn't matter. (laughs) I'm noticing it doesn't matter. What doesn't matter? The mindset that I had of just like hustle, 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 that will get you noticed. That will, that, like, that alone, that backbone alone will get you through. And it does teach you a lot. You know, perseverance is great, but there are forces that I had to face that literally was like, no, like, whether if it's because of skin or because of nepotism, because of just how Hollywood works. It's something that I had to realize. And again, that wall that I talked about earlier of like, okay, I can either stay here and keep doing the same thing that I'm doing. And I guess in this case, the wall being COVID, because that's when it happened. I could stay here and just continue to hustle in this environment, risk the fact that I'm probably going to go through a lot of conflict and somewhat lose myself through that all for the sake of my art. But then again, what would my art look like by the end of it? How would it feel? Or... I can use this and dive all the way into myself. I chose to double down on myself and to interact with life differently because now that I have the experience and now that I've proven to myself that, okay, I can move out here and I can do this and I know how to hustle and all of this, yada, yada. How do I make it to where my art's me? How is it noticeable? People see that, they're like, oh yeah, it's James. The power of saying no is a huge ingredient in your success. Because when you say yes to productivity or hyper-productivity, restlessness, grind, 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 more, more, and more culture, by saying yes to that, your default answer is you're saying no to sleep or recovery or reset or detachment. You can't have both. When you're younger in your college, you're short. I've had years of my life where I would sleep four hours a night for years when I was working full-time plus going to grad school full-time in my mid-20s, but it's not sustainable, right? You don't really feel it then, but I promise you as a clinician with deep knowledge and psychophysiological aspect of human performance and body, lack of sleep will catch up to you. Lack of sleep is correlated with Uh, lower future health index, higher uh, health issues, right? Increasing probability of neurological disease. The list goes on and on. And I'm scared for a couple of friends of mine who may have strokes at age late 30s or 40s because they're sleeping four or five hours a day every single... I mean, Jonathan Yu, the um, COO of the A-figure real estate business, one of my closest friends here, Man, he's been clocking in five, four or five hours of sleep for the past two years. And he took one week off because of the pandemic. And he's feeling it. And if we, and he's so young and so successful. At the same time, if he's going at the current rapid pace for the next 10 years, he's literally killing himself for the sake of whatever he's pursuing. And I have tremendous respect at the same time as a close friend. I care more about the longevity of peak performance. It's like in the gym, by compromising your form and just going as much volume or weights as possible, sure, you might get stronger faster, you're neglecting your recovery period, you are more prone to injury, that might make you out of the gym routine for months on end if you get injured, 
And because that has happened to me many times, right? And anytime that happens, I'm like, why did I do that? If I just went a little bit less intensive and prioritized my recovery and my food intake, I still will be working out right now while I'm in, in my bed recovering from my injury for two, three months. If you want to sustain, that's what sustainability is, is doing something longer. If you want to sustain your peak performance as this optimal performance junkie for a long time, you better make sure that sleep or recovery or mental health is not an afterthought, but an operational point. That's the only way to be optimal for a long time. I know that I can always get back into that. And I have caught myself multiple times doing that. Or if I do end up staying a couple hours later, uh, I'll make up for it. You know, I make sure to make up for it with self-treatment. It's an important thing. And I'm happy that I, I caught that because, man, YouTube doesn't say how important it is. There's nothing within the email or anything like that when you start that says, oh, yeah, sleep is important. Make sure to <laughs> make sure to look out for that when you decide to do this. Yeah, it's almost like world at large, there's still famine and food poverty in certain areas, right, for sure. But I think world at large, if you look at the data compared to 50 years ago, we have largely eradicated famine and a lot of these diseases that kill people. In a way, we created this digital famine that deprives of our energies, our mental well-being, physical well-being, time and intimate hangout session with their loved ones, family, friends. And if you look at Kobe Bryant, rest in power, he, I think he always got seven or eight hours of sleep. But what he does is he clocks out by like eight or 9 p.m. and he wakes up at three or 4 a.m. or 4 a.m. to work. If you do that math, I think it's about seven hours. And he just give out on drinking. He gives out on drugs. He just, I mean, he was Black Mamba for a reason. And he would sleep more than a lot of his athletes because he doesn't party or do drugs or whatever. He has way less distractions. At the same time, he's putting in more training hours than a lot of his colleagues. And he already has the baseline of greatness of talent, greatness of physicality, greatness of X, Y, and Z. Plus, he rests well. How do you compete with that? The answer is you can't. That's why he's one of the greatest ever. But then when people talk about Kobe, all they talk about is, oh, he used to get in the gym at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. He would work out. He would have four different training sessions a day. He did have four different training sessions because he got seven to eight hours of sleep as a non-negotiable. People love seeing A or B. It's and. You can be hyper-productive and hyper-focused and get the adequate optimal amount of sleep. That equation equals to longevity of peak performance. And these are the ingredients to make someone great. Because a lot of great people don't become great until they're 40, 50, 60s, right? And people forget that. A lot of these fame, success are compounded and iterated over time. So for us to become the future potentials of greatness that we all have, a lot of us have within us, you better make sure A, you live until 50 or 60, and B, you can sustain your peak performance until your 50s and 60s. Because how many child stars, how many TikTok and whatever celebrities, sure, 15, 14, they make millions. Of course, our parents get the money because of you know child protective, all that law. How many of those do we remember now? And how many of those have been just disappear from the face of the planet? Because they either burnt out or they redirected or they lost their arts or they lost who themselves whatever different reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, and also how many have lost themselves to, like you said, the famine that is now digital. Just for those who would like to study up more on, you know, what these, uh, how, how damaging these things can be psychologically, there's videos on YouTube where it showcases the up and downfall of some of these people simply because of they were overworked or, you know, depression through cyberbullying, through all these other things that are becoming more prevalent within the space of social media and just the unfortunate lack of things that are done about it through the corporations that are hosting these things. And, you know, that's where it does come down to, like, what are you going to do about it? You know, what does that mean for you? And I love talking with, you know, my mom. I love hanging out with her. I love hanging out with my friends. 
I love going on hikes. I love traveling. I love learning things. I love going and trying different foods. And I won't be able to do that if my mind isn't there. I can't do that if I'm too busy trying to appeal to, you know, YouTube or to a certain audience or things like that, because the things that I hold true to myself are vastly different and outside of the entity that I'm working in. You know, like I genuinely love doing all the things I just said that have to be outside of YouTube. But if I'm so involved, I will not have any time to enjoy the things that genuinely make me feel good, that genuinely help and heal me. And not to say that YouTube doesn't, not to say that doing YouTube doesn't, but there is a thin line that I think, you know, is is meant to be placed by the person that separates the two. And you have to be aware of bouncing between the two because if you mix, you know, that's where it gets messy. That's when the things that you're dealing with within this space starts leaking into the things that you truly cherish. And that's when it starts to damage. That's when it starts to hurt. And that's when you can unfortunately start hating the things that you love doing. And that's a terrible thing. And that's the, honestly, that was the fear of what I was dealing with for a lot of times. And that pushback on multiple occasions is due to the fear of that. I don't ever want to hate what I love doing. I don't want to ever hate creating art or enjoying art because I love doing it. I mean, I, it's it's everything that has brought me to where I am now. You know, I'm grateful to be 25 and alive and healthy and being able to create art and also, you know, post on YouTube for thousands of other people who I probably will never meet, but are also helping out. But then at the same time, eat breakfast with my mom, you know, like those things can coexist and are coexisting because I'm able to make that intention. Like when I was going back to say like, yes, I'm proud of, you know, one of the greatest achievements is, you know, that of sleep. It's, you know, the physical element of sleeping, but also the fact that I can genuinely sleep and wake up knowing that it's a fresh day and that whatever is in front of me, I can handle it. I can get through it because I'm giving myself the environment to do that. And you can only sleep well at night when you don't have too many skeletons or demons in your closet. And like I said, life is always about actions and reactions like thermodynamics, right? And the best way to minimize negative reactions, because life happens, no one ever said life is peaches and sunshine. Suffering is part of life. Way transcending just the Buddhist, Eastern philosophy, suffering is a part of life. I dare anyone give me one counterexample of someone that you know that has never endured any suffering. That does not exist. It's impossible, right? This is a truth. However, I do think that you can't avoid suffering, but you can avoid some unnecessary self-inflicted suffering. And that, that is by being intentional about your actions, right? And uh, one step to do that is prioritizing your headspace so there's no inner demons chatting all day, every day based on a certain actions you've done. But with that, man, I want to roll out the red carpet for people to connect further. Check out your James versus Cinema channel, any other personal film, creative projects that you have. How can people connect with you further offline? Yeah, 100%. So if anybody would like to see my body of work, the easiest way and most convenient is through Instagram. And that's is at James Adams III. That is James Adams the third with three lowercase i's. Um, and you can also check out the YouTube. That's where I usually do a lot of commentaries and analysis videos to films of all kinds. And that is James versus cinema on YouTube. So if you guys are interested in learning about films, you have that. And if you also would like to check out my work, my personal work that I enjoy creating, you can also do that too on the Instagram. So that's James Adams, I, 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 and then for YouTube as James versus cinema. I really enjoy watching the children of God. A movie that you analyze it's one of your best performing ones with millions of views great bodies of work speak for themselves period yeah with that being said um to all the listeners as always i really really appreciate you in joining and joining our week of train of discover more to further our curiosity to wield this curiosity to discover more about life and all the unknown there is um a lot of the youtube subscribers are not subscribed so if you can really press the subscribe button comment and like and if you thought our conversations brought any value to you today 
then I would love for you to share this with one friend that you think could benefit from our conversations. And with that, I will post all the resources, anything that we mentioned in the show notes below. And as always, hope to see you again next time on next train of Discover More.